Hello, Hello Ken Darcy. Welcome Hello. to the Virtual Sunday Book Club and thank you so much for joining us. Good um, evening. Thank you for having me back, Mary and everyone. So earlier this year, we had a discussion in the book club about your um, book, The Story of Afro Hair. Okay. Which is a brilliant book that is a celebration of the fashion styles of Afro hair over the past 5,000 years. But you've recently published a new book called The Story of Britain's Black Airmen. And we'd love to hear about your new book and have a discussion as well about the story of Afro hair. So um, my name is Candace. I'm a children's black history author. And I started writing books for children about black history, maybe about 13 years ago now. Um, I started out as a self-published author and I basically, I don't work in heritage or history. It was just something I started to do on the side and it is growing more and more. But the reason I did it was because when I would go into bookshops, and look at the selection of books available for children, because that's what I was particularly interested in, buying books for children. And when I saw the selection that was available here in London, in some of the biggest bookshops, considering this is a big developed country, country that was the center of an empire, the city that was the center of the empire, and all of this history. And whenever I went in the bookshops, and I did this for years, I would see the same six books or variations of the same six books or so year after year, every Black History Month. And usually the history books for children were very nice and attractive, really important stories. But I noticed that they were always stories about African-American history and occasionally South Africa, like Nelson Mandela. But usually it was the books about Rosa Parks and um, Martin Luther King Jr., Maybe you'd get things like Josephine Baker. So very important history, of course. I'm not saying they're not important, but I just couldn't understand why there was such a small selection. I couldn't understand why it was focused on African-American history, to me, at the expense of Black British history. And I know it's not about competing. There's space for all of it. But I just didn't understand that, seeing that I was in Britain. And yeah, for the reasons I said before. So I just decided to start self-publishing. And I was particularly interested and still I'm very interested in ancient history. And Jody mentioned that she had come on one of my Petrie Museum tours. So I started to go to museums more in my spare time, make connections with people there, look at the artifacts that were available do, you know, do tours, start to do tours, get the history together. And I wrote um, and self-published four books. The first three were ancient history. The first one was a little activity book. And that was kind of a test to see, first of all, whether I could do it. And secondly, to see if there would be any appetite for it. Because one of the things I did was I spoke to people that were in the community, the few people at the time, who were doing history, who were doing talks. And I told them about my idea. And they said to me, no, don't like books for children. People don't buy these books, black history books for children. If you want to do anything to do with black history, you've got to aim it at the adults. I was given very good advice. Um, that particular piece of advice, I decided not to follow because I knew in my heart that I wanted to do the books for the children. I thought it was important. So I felt, well, maybe even if it doesn't sell a lot or there are only a few, then, you know, at least I've still done something. And you never know, because I think when you do things like this, it's very hard in the current circumstances to expect to necessarily get the rewards that you think you should get. I think in a way you have to do it and think to yourself, it may you may not see the benefit of it now, but maybe it will benefit future generation so that's more the way I was sort of looking at it but I was pleasantly surprised because I um, did the first book the little activity book and it was about the ancient Sudan so it wasn't even about something you know it was a bit obscure and it was really popular I sold about 4,000 copies and I sold that without doing things correctly I mean I made the book nicely the history was done correctly but I forgot to do marketing so the book was on the ship coming 
and I'd forgotten to tell anyone about it. And then luckily I went to like an event and I was saying to someone and they had an event similar to this. And I just told a few people had a little slot like this, but all the people at the event liked it. They taught other people and it went from there. So I did two printings. So I said, okay, I'm going to do another one. And then I did a book about ancient Egypt. And that was um, using a lot of the artifacts that were in the Petrie Museum. And that museum is about, I don't know how far Jody would say, maybe 200 yards from the British Museum. I don't know. It's a teaching museum that Egyptologists go to. And very, very few people know it even exists. And it has 80,000 objects from ancient Egypt and the Sudan. So like Jody was saying earlier, you know, that history. I mean, I think Josie, Jody said it was erased. I think, um, I think to a degree it has actually been hidden. And I also think that some of it is hidden in plain sight. So we see it, but we don't recognize what it is because we're not educated to see what it is and we're not taught to see these things. So that was the second book. And then I did, and then the next book I did, which was still self-published, so I still paid for it myself and everything, but it was the first book that I was actually asked to write because the Fitzwilliam Museum were doing an exhibition in 2013 called Origins of the Afrocomb, looking at Afrocombs from ancient Egypt right through to the modern era. And I wrote a book about that called Secrets of the Afrocomb. And people liked that book. And a lot of people liked it who weren't interested in history as such, but were interested in here. And so I thought, well, that's that was good. And that's when I started to have the idea about the Afrocomb book. But my next book, I did have a gap then of about, about three years, actually, because one of the things that I didn't realize when I started self-publishing was that it wasn't just about research and writing. You have to post the books yourself. You have to do invoicing. You have to do all these things. So it actually kind of slowed me down a bit. So then I was thinking, what could I write? And I thought, and then in about 2017, I thought, well, next year, 2018, is the anniversary of the arrival of the Empire Windrush, the 70 year anniversary. And I thought, here we go again. That's a really important part of history. It's more modern, but it's really important. And I hadn't seen children's books about that either. So, I mean, we see a lot now, but at that time we didn't. So that's when I did my book, the self-published version of the story of the Windrush, which is like a little book, a little hardback book right here. Okay. Um, this one, the original version with the Windrush in white on the front, but actually it was gray at the time. So I've changed it. But that was my self-published version. And that came out in 2018. And I wanted it to be known for the 70th anniversary of the arrival of the Windrush. But unfortunately, that was also the year that the Windrush scandal broke. So a lot of people did hear about the Windrush, but they heard about it in the context of a scandal. And so then that was that. And then uh, the pandemic came and I just thought to myself, well, I've been doing this for about, I think at the time, 10 years now. And I thought, I don't want to really be lugging books around all the time. And I felt that people were making noise as if there could be a bit of a change. So I decided to see if I could become traditionally published, give up on the self-publishing and see if I could get a publisher who would share my vision of producing books for children, particularly with Black history, but other histories as well. But you know, much more black history. And um, Scholastic UK, who are a dedicated children's publisher, did offer me the deal that I wanted because one of the things I said was I wanted the story of the Windrush to be reprinted. And they republished the book pretty much the same as the original, same format. Um, we just changed the color of the ship and they just made a few little tweaks inside, but it's very, very similar to the original version. And that was the first book. And the second book was The Story of Afro Here. The third book, which is the one that's just come out, is The Story of Britain's Black Airmen. And they actually extended the deal from three books to five. So we'll have another book next year and another one the year after. And you'll be amongst the first to know, as soon as I'm able to say, <laughs> you'll be amongst the first to know. So the response has been good. 
um, they are now getting into schools as well because having that backing of a, a, a traditional publisher who have those sort of networks and things that I didn't have. I mean, the Windrush book, I have to say, even when that was self-published version, there were teachers who were using it. So, you know, kudos to them and people in the community who were pushing for it anyway. But now having a publisher like Scholastic, who are, a, a, you know, an educational publisher and teachers and librarians know them, it does help a bit more to get that history out there. So the book, uh, The Story of Britain's Black Airmen, this idea came to me in 2018 after I'd published the, my self-published version of the story of the Windrush. Because um, obviously it was self-published, so I chose all the photos in the book. I did the writing. I got someone to do the illustrations. And then after the book was published and it was out there, and I had a copy of it. And I don't know why, but for some reason I was looking at the book. I don't know if someone asked me a question or I don't really remember exactly why. But I remember I was here on this sofa and I was looking at the last photo I put in the book, which is on page 41. Just show you it here. I don't know if you can see it. It's a photo of men arriving on the Windrush, and there are two men talking to them who are from the RAF. There's a white man and a black man, both in RAF uniform. And they're talking to this group of men who were on the Windrush, who I believe all of them, or most of them, might have been ex-servicemen. So they had been to Britain before, or maybe they weren't, but they were being told about jobs that were available. Now they were here in Britain on um, with the RAF, the Royal Air Force. And when I chose that photo for the book, it's funny how your mind works. Sometimes when you're focused on one thing, even if there are other things around, I guess that's why we miss the black history because we're not focused on it. So even though there are things there, we don't notice them. So when I chose that photo, I chose that photo for one reason, because Sam King is in the photo and the story of the Windrush was being told sort of through his eyes. It's not his autobiography, but a bit through his eyes. So he's right at the back, the man right at the back. And he looks a kind of, to me in the photo, I don't know, I just like the photo because he looks a bit shy. And I'd seen him speak a couple of times. And um, I just thought he was a, a, you know, I just liked what he did. And he'd come on the Windrush. He'd set up the Windrush Foundation. He was doing work for the community. He came the first Black Mayor of Southwark, where I live. And so he was, you know, part of the inspiration for the book. And that's why I chose that photo. I do remember when I looked at the photo, I did think, oh, that's a black man in uniform. But that was all, it just, it didn't really focus. So it was only after when I was sitting down looking at this photo for some reason that it clicked to me that the tall man in the RAF uniform is a gentleman called Johnny Smythe. And I knew about Johnny Smythe, but I just hadn't really, re I don't know, I just hadn't noticed that he was in that photo. So that's Johnny Smythe here on the front of this book as well. So Johnny Smythe was actually on the Empire Windrush. He was on the ship when it went out because we focus very much on the arrival of the Windrush in June, 1948. But remember, as I explained this book, it was a troop ship and it did lots of voyages all over the world. It went to Singapore, it went to Egypt, Suez Canal, it went to it went to all these different places, taking British troops to places because of the empire. It only did one trip to the Caribbean and back, as far as I can see from all the research I've done. But it's that one trip that everyone remembers it for, because of course, that's the trip that was bringing black people on the ship. So everyone talks about that one, and that's how you know the Windrush generation are named after that one trip. But don't forget, it did all these other trips. So when I looked at that photo, I started to think a bit about Sam King and even the story of the Windrush. Yes, the story is about the people coming in 48, but some of the people like Sam King, they had been to Britain before. They had contributed during the Second World War, as we know, and people like Johnny Smythe. And I just was really fascinated by that. And that's when I got the idea 
to write the book of the Black Airmen. And then the second thing, although I'd already had the idea, the next thing I did was I started to look at what books were available, what was already out there, not particularly for children, but even adult books. And it so happened that 2018 was also the 100 year anniversary of the Royal Air Force. And you might remember there was um, something called RAF 100. There was a big fly pass with the Queen there and you know the red arrows and all of this thing. There were loads of books. And I went and I looked at all of the books I could find and I could only see one that even mentioned the Caribbean airmen in the Second World War. Most of these books never mentioned them. So that's then how I developed the idea a bit more that this was another book that we now need, uh, the story of Britain's Black Airmen. But the book itself, it's not, um, a few people have said, oh, it's a book about the contributions of Black Airmen to Second World War and First World War. That's actually not completely accurate. What I've tried to do with the book is trace the story of the contributions from aviation in the beginning right through to the, the Second World War. So there is a little bit of before the First World War, even though it wasn't easy for Black people to become airmen or men, but there were still some. And I was able to find one who had never been written about in a children's book before. So, um, so I just, yeah, so I just put that information in there. I also wanted the airmen to be remembered, not just for their contributions to Britain though, I wanted them to be recognized pretty much I would say as global citizens because there are also contributions that they made after the war. There was one who contributed to the American civil rights. There's one who became the first premier of Barbados, the first president I should say, uh, prime minister I should say. They, they did, you know, they just really, I think under under what's the word not represented under known <laughs> well, that's not really the word but you know what I mean they're not known about enough and so that's what I want to do with this book sorry <laughs> going on and on <laughs> no thank you thank you Candace I have to say some of the um men the airmen who were features as you say you know some of them were before the Windrush during or after um the um, we're talking about black history with um Jody as well and how important it is for us to know our history and I have to say your book is really informative because I didn't realize that Errol Barrow was the prime minister of Barbados and in yeah. in the forces um I didn't quite get the connection with Cy Grant as well um, and then Sam King, who I'd read a bit about in Jody's um, book, is also featured. So it really does help tie in loose ends of our history. You yeah. know, again, with going echoing what Jody said about our history being hidden in plain sight because it's not talked about enough. Yes. Um, it's not featured enough. So a lot of us may not. I can speak for myself. Did not know about Britain's first black airmen. Um, or the airmen that you feature in your book. So it's really informative and interesting. And the other thing I found interesting about the airmen you featured is how multi-talented they all are. Yes. Incredibly multi-talented. Yes. Um, Cy Grant, who features in your book, is a flight lieutenant uh, from British Guyana, a poet as well. Uh, and then became an actor because he couldn't get the work that he was doing previously when he stayed in, in the UK. Incredible. Um, and then obviously the Prime Minister of Barbados, um, Errol Walton Barrow. I didn't know much about his story. Um, so I think the great thing your book does is features these people who've contributed, as you say, not just to British history and you know, the success of make the RAF, but as global citizens, um, I was, be before um, we came on, I was just looking on something on YouTube about um, John Henry Smythe and his son yes. was talking about a story where his um, father met the person who shot his plane down somewhere in a different part of the world, a German fighter. And I thought that is so interesting. And I think what we learn from, the more we learn about 
black history and revised history, we see that our histories are so interconnected. You know, uh, black history is British history, but it's also world history as well. It is, it is. And this is why when I started doing these books, that's why, I, as I said, I was just so shocked when I just walked into the shops and just saw this small selection of books and not even British history or, you know, much less world history. But yeah, I mean, all of these three men that you've mentioned, they are British because they're part of the British Empire. They have come to Britain to fight during the Second World War, but they also are contributing further afield. As you said, Errol Barrow, I mean, for me, even growing up, you know, having my secondary education in Barbados, I know about him. He's our father of independence. His birthday is a bank holiday in Barbados. But, and I know about the contributions he made to Barbados, but there's much, much less known about his contributions during the Second World War to Britain. We don't ourselves even talk so much about that in Barbados, but I think that's quite important because that's probably helping to form some of their ideas that and the things that they then go on to do after the war ends as well. John Henry Smythe, he also, um, so Errol Barrow became a barrister. John Henry Smythe also became, I believe, a barrister, but definitely a lawyer. And he was a Solicitor General of Sierra Leone when it became independent from Britain. So you're seeing that they are fighting for Britain but then there's this move that they're still involved after that in leading their countries or being playing a role in leading their countries to freedom or self-rule. Some people might argue we're not fully independent. That's a, another argument and maybe there is still work to do. But the point is that they are playing a role in leading the countries then into what we call independence. John Henry Smythe, he also goes on, as I say in the book later, to the states to promote uh, Sierra Leone and improve relations. And he actually is in the crowd when Martin Luther King um, gives a speech, I have a dream. And that's recorded in some newspapers in America, some African-American newspapers. That's where I found this information and was able to you know, do some more research around that. Cy Grant is interesting because he also becomes a barrister as do Errol Barrow and John Henry Smythe, but he is unable to find work as a barrister. He remains in England, unlike them, and he is unable to find work in Britain. And he says it was because of the racism at the time. So he does become an actor because these men are very, very multi-talented. They can do many things and he could do many things, but it wasn't his first choice to become an actor or an entertainer. He did that because that was the work that he could find. And he's very, very clear about that in his writings. So obviously as a children's book, you know, I do mention all this, but it has to be done obviously in an age appropriate way, but we do need to understand that these things did happen. And, you know, Jody mentioned earlier about Harold Moody. I mean, he's not in this book, this book is about airmen, but as early as 1930, setting up an organization to help fight racism. So, you know, we have to remember that these men, they helped to get us to where we are today. It didn't just happen, you know, there was a fight and they did that. Lincoln Lynch, I mentioned earlier, though not by name, he was an air gunner. Um, I think he was from Jamaica. And after the war, he goes on to America and he becomes involved in the civil rights uh, movement in the States. So they're really interesting. And it's a shame for me that there's not um, more autobiographies of them or more wasn't, more interest wasn't paid in, paid to this when they were alive, that more questions could have been asked, but at least there is still some information and, you know, and that's what I've tried to get and put into the book. Thank you. Can, Mary, can, I, just, can I just add something there? I just wanted to, oh, thanks, Candancy. I just think as a librarian, it is just so important for the children to have heroes and sheroes. Mm -hmm. It's just vital. And I think part of doing the Black London book, it really came out of frustration, particularly during Black History Month. Just as you said, it was all African-American history. I'm thinking, I just thought the same
same as you, but there's black British. Where, where, where are we in this story? We're, we're all very interlinked, but that is important. And also the other thing to say is, you know, this history, like you were saying, Mary, this history is everyone's history. It's our history and it's British history. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Brixton, you've got the memorial there for the African and Car um, Caribbean soldiers. Oh. Um, well, all of the Air Force that participated in the war. And this is this was just very key. When you think two million people participated in that war mm -hmm. and that and they've been erased from it. But, and if English people don't learn that and they're questioning, well, you didn't do anything in the war, but mm. two million people, you can't just erase two mm. million people. So the, these stories are just very, very important. And as Kandansi was saying, they're the generation that fought on for Pan-Africanism and for our rights for later on, you know, the Harold Moody's and the Sam Kings. Mm. We're, we stand on all of their shoulders, really. Mm. And it's getting our voices and our stories out there as well. They all make ripples. And I think for this Black History Month, I just love that theme. When you said the theme, I was thinking, what's the theme? <laughs> Time for change. It's so true. We, we, you can speak and you can speak, but you have, to, you have to think, what are you doing? What are you doing to make a slightest change? You know, are you buying a book? Are you supporting? What, what, what are you doing in your organisation that shows diversity? Not just a tick box for just Black History Month. Mm. You know, it has to be 365. And you just got to think, what can you do? Really important. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jody, And thank you, Kandase. Just wondering if anyone had any comments about um, Kandase's book. We'll obviously read Kandase's book together. Thank you. I mean, I've just learned so much just listening to you. The Petri Museum is on my list straight away of somewhere I need to visit. And your book, the hair book, I got that for my niece and it's just the most beautifully illustrated book. So really looking forward to- I didn't do the illustrations. I cannot I draw. Know. <laughs> I know, but the way it was put together, the yes. story, yeah. everything, it's just a beautifully, yeah, that's the one, beautifully put together oh. book, you know? So um, thank you for that. My niece really loves it. So I'm really looking forward to hearing this because I've just been, my mind's like this because I suppose from a Black British kind of Af West African background, I know of Nkrumah and his involvement in Black British politics and the whole African Union then. And a lot of them went back to form a lot of the governments and were leaders in the West African context. So hearing that about the Caribbean in this context is something that I just was not aware of. So I really yeah. look forward to reading this book and learning more. Thank you for your time and the explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Thank you Candace. Conference. Thank you. That was so informative. And um, I am going to get the airman book for my my godson. Um, his birthday is in a couple of weeks. So um, that'll be a great present to add to what I've already got him. So thank you so much. So <laughs> and, you know, uh, today has been, you know, they say every day is a school day. Well, this past couple of hours has been a school lesson, in, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I've learned so much. Thank mm. you. Thank you. I was just going to make a quick comment about Candace's books. Sorry. Mm -hmm. this book and your your um, new book mm -hmm. what I love about your books mm -hmm. is the fact that it's accessible to everyone they're books for everyone mm -hmm. um, I have no shame in saying I've got copies of this book but I've kept one of them for myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because it's so educational the illustrations are beautiful they just help you it you know retaining some of the interesting history that you read mm -hmm. um so they're books for everyone. And I will stress that they're books that not just people of color should read. Mm -hmm. um, the story of Afro hair, as I said earlier, is a celebration of history as well, mm -hmm. black people's hair through history. But it mm -hmm. goes back to, again, uh, Tudor times, mm -hmm. the influence of hairstyles um, it, with the era of Henry VIII, um, it takes you to ancient medieval Africa, takes you to the Benin kingdom. And again, it's a, it's a story of our hair, a story of the history of our hair, but again, interlinked between the UK, the US, Africa. So a really great book. And I, I would really urge everyone to sometimes not pigeonhole themselves mm -hmm. to read books that are targeted at adults and not read books that are targeted for children because you'd be missing out um this it's so easily written so beautifully written very informative very educational 
um, and, and we learn a lot from children. And I think this is a book to read with children and not a book just to be read by children. I would say I'd recommend everyone to read this book. I don't know if you can see there some of the fantastic illustrations and that bit there is just going back to the history of um, medieval Africa. Do we have a bit of time to talk about the story of Afro here as well, Kendesi? Yeah, of course. Yes, I'm happy to talk yeah. about it as well. Yeah, so it, it takes us right back uh, to ancient Egypt, as I said earlier, Benin Kingdom, and speeds us along to the Rastafarian era, dreadlocks, um, takes us back over to France, jo Josephine Baker, with Baker Fix, and then we go to the US. Um, Madam CJ Walker features in the book. Um, we learn about poro oil and the pressing oils that were used in hair. And I think the last time you came to the, our book um, discussion and we talked about the story of Afro hair, we also mentioned something about the US Crown Act, mm -hmm. um, which had come out mm -hmm. in the, in, I think that was earlier this year, it was passed earlier this year. And we talked Did about we? the whole idea of Afro hair and bringing your whole self to work. And some of us not being as comfortable as others, you know, to feel that they could represent themselves as professional within their workspace with Afro hair. I didn't, re I couldn't remember if we did or not, but um, the Crown Act, I was really surprised they actually recommended that book um, as a read for, I think it was National Literacy Day in the US um, a few weeks ago. And they did a post with a few authors and the other authors were African-American and the other books were as well. Mm -hmm. And they put the story of Afro hair on there as well and said, um, yeah, just put me as well. So I think I found that was quite interesting because, like I said, when I started doing what I do, I did it because I found all of the books were African-American history. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because it does show that it can also work the other way. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah I was included in the Crown Act so the Crown Act um, I didn't remember that we spoke about it on our, on our discussion before but they've been doing some great work in the US they are aiming to get legislation passed in every state to make um, race-based hair discrimination illegal and so far I think they first of all got Florida got the act passed in Florida and I don't remember how many other states they've they've been successful at having that legislation or similar legislation. It's there there are a few, and they're working on having it, you know, at the federal level as well as mm -hmm. having every state pass legislation to make that discrimination illegal mm -hmm. in schools and workplaces. So they've been doing really good work, and um, yeah, I was chuffed that they recommended the story of Afro here it's not a book that is available in American stores but obviously when people see that they can still you know order it online and get a hold of it so yeah so I was pleased about that but I didn't remember that we had talked about the Crown Act at the time. Yes yeah, speaking about um, you know hair being political mm -hmm. going back to Trevor Noah's Born a Crime mm -hmm. um, the classification for races during the apartheid was something, they, they used something called the pencil test. Oh, yeah. and, and that was uh, a sort of test to classify the texture of your hair. Mm. So I believe if you could keep a pencil in, mm. you'd probably have Afro hair mm. and you'd be one, you know, deemed as one race. And then if you, the pencil fell out, I'm assuming you'll be deemed as another race, just shows you how political hair is. And um, hair, as they say, isn't just hair. And the Nazis also had something similar as well. Um, the story of Afro hair book was a book that I thought about writing because it's when I was saying about the Airman book, that idea came after I'd done the Windrush book and it came out of that. And the story of Afro hair also came out of a book that I'd done before, or, or, well, part of a project as well, because in 2013, as I mentioned, um, I wrote the book Secrets of the Afro Comb. And that book was the first time I was actually asked to write a book. So I still self-published it. But the Fitzwilliam Museum at the time were doing an exhibition called Origins of the Afro Comb, where they were looking, I think I mentioned about the Afri African combs from ancient Egypt right through to the modern era. 
And although the exhibition was more focused on the cones, you know, I did see some information about hair, which is what led to my thinking about doing this book, the story of Afro hair. But one of the things that I also found out as a result of that exhibition was that the Nazis had a this thing. It's um, there's one at UCL. It's a little thing. It looks about the size of a pencil case, and it's a tin, and you open it, and inside that tin it has hair. I think it's synthetic made, but it's a grading system. So it's got these tufts of hair in different colors and textures. And then what they can do is just open that tin and hold it up to a person's hair and you can grade a person's humanity, right to live or whatever by using this tin. And there's one at UCL. And the reason it's at UCL here in London is because again, we forget some of these histories. We forget that eugenics was invented here in the UK. These ideas were not invented in Germany. They were invented here in the context of empire. And then from here, they get exported or maybe picked up in America and picked up in you know, Germany or whatever. But that tin was here. It was made by the Nazis, but it, you know, all of these things are interlinked in ways that we often don't see because we're taught to see things as being completely discreet when actually they're a lot more linked than we realize. So, yeah, so it's all, you know, not in a good way, but yeah, but important, it's important to know those things as well. So it's not just South Africa. It's, you know, maybe there weren't, some of these things weren't carried out here, but there definitely was, as you said earlier, an influence from here. And these ideas are spreading out you know, back and forth, I'm not saying it, but you know, but they do, there is also a role that happens from here as well. Yeah, so um, your, your book, as I said earlier, shines a spotlight on Black history, but not just in the UK, around the globe. So you yes. feature people like Madam C.J. Walker, um, someone called Annie, is that right? Annie Malone, yes. Yes, um, and then we've got a lovely picture of, that a lot of people would recognise. And again, you talk about some of the challenges that some of the um, people featured in your book in the UK faced when they tried to open their own salons, you know, starting off their own businesses, the banks not really supporting them and giving them loans to be able to do that easily. I think that's with Dyke, Dryden and Wade. Yeah. Again, people that prior to reading this book, I'd never heard about. And we really should know about Dyke and Dryden and Wade, really, because they're pioneers in Afro hair industry in Britain. Mm. You know, we probably know more about Madam C.J. Walker than we do about them. Mm. And yet they did something, you know, they became multimillionaires. They pioneered the industry here in the UK. They were also a good example of business. And Wade, he wrote three books. So it's not to say that he didn't write. He actually specifically wrote three books. And people that are interested in business, even if you're not interested in hair, just being interested in history or interested in business should know about him mm. and know about what he did with the other two men and should know that history. But even I didn't really know much about it, to be honest. It was more through the Afrocom exhibition. That I heard a little bit. And then was able to do a bit more research but the information is there it's just I think as well it's quite time consuming having to do the research you know it does take time to follow up leads to read books to talk to people so but hopefully putting it in a book like this will make it a bit easier for people to you know know about some of these stories and then even do further research because they are children's books and books written for adults who are short of time and want a quick read as well. But they are designed very much to um, encourage further learning. And that's why in a book like The Story of Afro here, I do try to put quite a lot in over a long period of time so that you can see how things connect, but also then see areas that you might be more interested in delving into a bit more as well. So that's that's why I kind of write them in that way as well. And I've done similar with the Airmen book as well. It's a smaller book, but it is written in a style where you can do further research on particular people or particular eras or topics and 
hopefully children will use it for school projects and things like that as well. Thank you again, Kandase. Does anyone have any comments or questions for Kandase about her books? I had a question on who who was the person's name she said was that we should know. I know she I know talk about Madam CJ Walker, but the person she was uh, talking about we should know in the UK as far as development of hair products. Dyke and Dryden was the name of the company. Um, but the three men are Dyke, Dryden and Wade. So there were three men and they are part of the Windrush generation. Two of them came from Jamaica and I think Wade came from, I'm not sure, I've forgotten now. It's in the book, maybe Montserrat, I'm not sure. He came from another island. And Dyke and Dryden, at first they used to sell records. They used to import records from Jamaica so people could get, you know, the nice Caribbean music that we love and still love today. And um, Wade set up an import-export company. And then the three of them got together to have a meeting about how they could improve business or whatever. And I don't know how the idea came, but they decided to go into beauty products because at that time, as they said, as Wade said in his book, there were no um, products for our, our women. So they were doing this out of a sense of responsibility. And that's one of the things that I want to make clear in the Afro Hair book, so Afro Hair, that business is not a dirty word. It really isn't. It is about providing services for people. It's about helping people. And I didn't delve a lot into their life, but I believe that they seem to have been Christians as well. And um, interestingly, as was Sam King, I didn't mention this a lot in my book, but again, you know, they seem to be driven very much by a, yeah, really great principles. Um, and that's how they started their business. They decided to keep the name of Dyke and Dryden. So, cause Wade felt that putting Wade on will make it too, too much. They just kept Dyke and Dryden but the three of them were in it together and they built up the business and yeah, became great success stories that then have been kind of forgotten. And I also want to add, off, going off the topic a little bit on the idea of social responsibility, Errol Barrow, he came from a wealthy family in Barbados. Um, obviously at that time, most of the wealth, you know, we would, it wasn't so common have wealthy black people but he came from a wealthy family his family were well off and they were very very much about improving life for people in Barbados obviously that's what they were thinking about but they were very much against the poverty and the racism that was prevalent in Barbados I think a lot of people see Barbados today and they think oh it's a really nice country and you have a good standard of living it wasn't like that before it was one of the poorest countries it was a part of the empire that is how it was so this I think when we are educating children and showing them these stories we need to show them as well that business isn't about ripping people off it isn't a bad thing it's about providing services and providing products that help your community and can help the wider community as well and that's the approach that I'd like to see coming out of these books in the story of Afro here, I also mentioned the story of Viola, I forgot her name now, <laughs> in The Canadian Woman. She's on the Canadian $10, I think. She comes after Madam C.J. Walker. And her story is important because she wasn't... Viola Desmond. That's it. She wasn't a success, but it's still important to show that she still tried. And it's important to show how the, the conditions at the time could help to bring someone down. So I also wanted to put her story in so that there's the success stories, but people could also see that not everyone always succeeded because it's important to, you know, be, to be honest and to show, to show that to the children so they can understand how things are today and learn for the future as well. Because like I said, I think a lot of what I'm doing is for people to know about now, but I'm hoping the benefits will be, you know, for the future generations. That's what the history is about. It's not, you know, it's not about because you're living in the past. It's because you're using the past to influence the present and to influence the future. That's why history is important. I want to also ask, uh, sort of ask, 
when you when you talk about uh Madam CJ Walker, you mentioned Annie Malone. Isn't yeah. like now we're finding out that that Madam CJ Walker kind of took her took <laughs> took her product and and sort of like became rich from from her Annie Malone's work. Well, the way I presented it in the book, which is the way I understood it at the time, was that there were, well, I didn't say this in the book, but there were actually quite a lot of women doing this wonderful hair grower. So I don't think the wonderful hair grower idea itself was unique to either of them. But obviously Annie Malone came before Madam C.J. Walker, as I do explain in the book. And I do say in the book that, um, yeah, Madam C.J. Walker did um, work for Annie Malone for a short time. They fell out. I don't know what the falling out was about, but I've put that in there and became rivals for the rest of their lives, which is true. Madam C.J. Walker obviously went on to become better known and probably more successful. I know people do say that Annie Malone may have become a millionaire before and probably was a millionaire, but the document, you know, documented evidence is, seems to be a bit harder to find. Whereas with Madam C.J. Walker, you've got the documentation. And she was also very good at being very uh, flamboyant and showing her wealth. And, you know, so everyone could see that she had the wealth as well. But certainly Annie Malone, I mean, there's still the Children's um, the children's Center that still has her name to this day in the States. And she also, also did charity work as well and supported charitable causes. So I've just presented it that way. I mean, sometimes, unfortunately, businesses and people do start to rival each other. It's That's what happens. So, you know, I put that in there. But there were other people doing the wonderful hair growers at the time, not even just the two of them. And there was another lady that I wanted to put in the book, but I just can't get everything in. So I didn't, you know, so I just focused really on those two more for that era to try and illustrate. But there were definitely others as well. Well, Candace, thank you ever so much for joining us today to talk to us about both of your books. We can't wait to read your new book and we hope you join us again um, in a new year to talk about your recently published book, The Story of Black Britain's Black Airmen. Looking forward to reading that. Um, the Story of Afro Hair is a great book. So if you haven't got this book, or if you want to read it with a child, <laughs> like I've been doing, um, it's a great gift for any child, but it's definitely a book that anyone can read. It's a book that everyone really ought to read. It's not just a book targeted to children, but it's a book, a great book for adult, adults as well. And it's not just about Afro hairs. We all have um, learned from our discussions today, Afro hair is still fairly political. And there's so much more to learn. Kandase didn't talk um, about the science of Afro hair, but this book delves into the science of Afro hair as well. And I haven't read that many books for children that talk about the science of Afro hair. So it's a great one to read. Thank you again, Kandase, for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me and thank you for your lovely comments. And thank you, Jodie, for um, joining us to celebrate Black History Month. We look forward to doing another trip to one of the great places that you've recommended in your book. Earlier this year was the Windrush Monument um, at Waterloo Station and Mary Seacole's statue. And hopefully we'll do a few more um, mm -hmm. in the new year. Thank you, Jodie. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. It's been really interesting. <laughs> happy, happy Black History thank Month. <laughs> Thank you. So before we, um, yeah, before we um, end our uh, book club session today, I was just going to mention the books we're going to be discussing next week. So we're going to be um, in conversation with Bernard Sims, who's with us now. Bernard is going to be talking to us about his book. He's going to be transporting us to the US and giving us some great tips um, from his book. Um, Bernard, do you have a copy of your book by any chance there? Yeah, I meant to have one. I was on a national interview the other day and I didn't have a copy and you got me again. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Thank you, Bernard. So we also have Celeste Mohammed joining us and she's going to be talking to us about Pleasant View. It's not a book we've read yet, but it's definitely one on our to be read list. Mm -hmm. So I can't 
wait to have a discussion with Celeste about the inspiration to write this book. There's a lot of buzz about Pleasant View around. So looking forward to reading it and discussing with um, Celeste Mohammed. We have another author joining us. So we might have three authors joining us, not confirmed at the moment, but we'll let you know. So next week we'll be discussing with Bernard. We'll be discussing with Celeste Mohammed, and we're going to be talking about a really great book that was nominated by Oge, which we all really um, enjoyed reading, Finding Me by Viola Davis. So thanks everyone for sharing your thoughts and reflections on Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. Thank you for contributing to a great um, Black History Month book club discussion today. Looking forward to seeing you next week. We'll have a little less time next week to talk about um, Viola Davis's book because we may have three authors joining us. So if we can start promptly at five, that would be great to give us time to talk about um, Viola's book, which is a really good book. <laughs>